Awesome. So good afternoon, everybody, whether you're joining us live, watching us on YouTube or uh, watching us afterwards, after the fact. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for taking time out of your day for uh, joining us in this humanities career panel. Uh, my name is Azalea and I'm very excited to be a moderator for today. Uh, for all of you who are tuning into a Millie event for the first time, Millie is a company dedicated to building a community for international school students all around the world. And to that uh, effect, we host webinars and panels like this almost every single weekend. Um, you can find an archive of all of our past events on our website, uh, www.milliegroup.com. You can also find a schedule for all of our future events there as well. Uh, in one and a half hour, we also have another panel, this time about Middle Eastern campuses. So if you're also interested in that, you can still sign up on our website. And if you do want to keep up to date with all of the things that we are uh, is going on at Millie, please follow our Instagram at Millie underscore group. Um, okay, so that's my little intro spiel. Uh, so this is how today's panel is going to look like. Uh, I have some pre-prepared questions for our panelists um, for the first sort of 45 minutes. And um, I've talked to all of them. They're very cool. So if you also want to ask your own questions to them, you're more than welcome to in our uh, Q&A uh, function. Um, you can ask questions to all of our panelists uh, or you can ask a, a question to a panelist in particular. I'll, make, I'll try my best to make sure that all of the questions uh, uh, get asked. And personally, this is a very exciting panel for me as well, because I can contribute a little bit. Um, this is a background about myself. I did my bachelor's in history at uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and I'm now doing my PhD in history at University College Dublin. So I'm very excited to sort of put my two cents into this uh, panel as well. So now that I've introduced myself, uh, let's pass the mic over to our panelists. Um, could everybody please sort of go around the room and introduce yourself. So what's your name, which university you went to, what major you did, where you're currently based, and one fun fact about yourself. Brian, if you could start us off, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Ting. I did um, a BA in Literary Humanioris um, at Oxford, and then I went to Cambridge to do an MPhil in Classics. Um, I'm originally from Singapore, and I'm back in Singapore now. Um, one fun fact about myself is um, we have mandatory national service in Singapore, so I was a policeman for two years. Uh, all right. Hi, my name is Zina. I studied at the University of Exeter uh, doing history and international relations, a joint degree for my undergraduate, during which I went to Seoul and South Korea and studied at Iwa Women's University for one year. I'm currently pursuing my master's in history of international relations at the LSE in London, which is where I currently am. Uh, I was originally actually born in the States. I'm from New York, moved to England when I was nine, completed essentially all of my education in the UK, but obviously I still sound and am quite American. Uh, and yeah, I've studied mostly histories and also various social sciences. I lived in China for a bit, worked at a nonprofit in New York, but I am back in London and yeah, I mean, a fun fact about me is that my last name is Starbucks, but I'm not related to the coffee shop, uh, unfortunately. I think I would still be doing humanities and history, though, even if I were, like, you know, the daughter of a conglomerate coffee people. So, yeah, <laughs> nice to virtually meet you all. Hi, nice to meet everyone. I'm Sophia. Um, I studied classics, so literary humanioris like Brian um, at the University of Oxford, Lady Margaret Hall, um, and that was my BA, and I live in London with my parents. Um, fun fact about myself is that no one can ever work out where I'm from, but I'm half Iranian, but um, yeah, so kind of, yeah. Wonderful. Didn't know we had a cop on our panel. <laughs> um, so, okay, so um, that, that's a great sort of in, introductory round. And uh, another sort of question that we can go around the room is, uh, could you briefly explain what your study is and also what your specialization is as well? I think that the fun part about humanities degree is that so many topics that we can, that we can cover. So it's always interesting to see what sort of niche so, uh, everybody has found themselves into. Brian, if you could start us off, please. Yes, and uh, Sophia can help fill in all the gaps that I will inevitably um, have. Um, so classics, I think, is the study 
uh, broadly speaking, of the um, ancient Greco-Roman world um, in sort of chronological speak. That more or less means anything from 700 BC to about 400-ish um, AD, um, geograph geographically speaking. Um, it's anywhere really from the north of England um, down to Egypt, um, the Red Sea, um, all the way to Iran and Iraq um, to the east. So it really covers a massive, um, a massive geography well beyond Greece um, and Italy uh, themselves. Um, Fields-wise, it covers everything from the languages and literature to philosophy, um, history, and archaeology. Um, my kind of pet topics uh, in classics um, have to do with the intersection of the economy and society. Um, so a lot of my research is around um, not thinking about economic growth, um, but thinking about how the economy operates on a very sort of day-to-day -day, um, basis. All right, so I'll, I'll jump in and switch away from classics. So in the humanities, I, my field is history. Um, I do also specialize in and study international relations, which is a social science officially. However, I am of the controversial opinion that international relations is not a social science and is much more of a humanities. So I like to combine the two of them in everything I do. Uh, I would say that my specialisms in the field of history, which I think history doesn't need that much of an explanation. You know, we're, we're looking at the past and thinking about the past and what happened, why it happened. Although, you know, the discipline of history has a lot of multi multifaceted areas and debates going on in it. But I, I like to look at more modern history, I would say from probably the 1900s onward. I specialize mostly in imperial history and colonial history, looking at East Asia and the USA, um, and kind of how these more imperial colonial legacies from especially like the Qing Empire in China, and then also, of course, the British Empire, French Empire, how these have led to changes in identities and social structures, looking at gender, and then also identity politics, ethnicities, et cetera, changing over time, and then yeah, just how we've gotten to where we are. But at the moment I'm reading, I'm reading and researching for a paper on the role of film in uh, <laughs> influencing Asian American identity from the 1920s to the 1960s leading up to the Asian American movement. So yeah, I think that's the thing with history. Like there's so many niches, so it's kind of hard to, <laughs> to say what I do, but that was a very, uh, not so brief attempts at describing it, but yeah, I like to look at the international, gender, identity, East Asia, America, imperialism. Here we go. That's so interesting, Zena. And I feel like classics and history have that in common. They're both very multifaceted, um, so many different niches, as you were saying. Um, and kind of, I think Brian, you did a very good job explaining classics. So I won't kind of retread the same ground, but just to really kind of emphasize the point that it covers, classics covers such, when, when we think of the Greco-Roman world, it is so much more than just Greece and just kind of Rome or just Italy. Um, it really is very, very diverse. And I think that's one of the things that's kind of the most appealing about it. And kind of, so you can really find, you know, where your passions lie um, and a very, very broad range of disciplines as well. Kind of, you know, not just kind of your languages and literature or even history and archeology, span but, you know, as Brian was saying, kind of philosophy, philology, um, kind of numismatics um, um which is kind of the study of ancient coins and all sorts of things um and it's really really interesting and so my kind of speciality uh kind of specialism i guess um was more kind of um in the archaeology art and archaeology um and at undergrad i did a thesis on ancient female drapery in kind of classical greek sculpture and vases and kind of trying to unpick the greeks kind of contradictory cultural ideals um uh, looking at a very specific kind of drapery called wet drapery or transparent drapery, um, which I absolutely loved. So um, any questions about that, you know, anyone can feel free to ask in the comments. 
that's wonderful. Oh, I'm, I, it always makes me so happy to hear people talking about their research because I feel like there's a light in your eyes that that that, that sort of sparks up. Um, I, I can sort of jump in and sort of explain what what my experience of history is. So what Zina said is precisely correct. History is the study of the past and sort of how do we get here? And uh, converse, uh, very controversially, some people might say that history can also, you know, might be used to sort of figure out what can we do in the future as well. We, we'll, we can have a conversation about that later, whether that's true or not. Um, my uh, specialization actually is uh, the cross section between environmental history and regional history, particularly in Southeast Asia. I wrote my um, thesis about uh, the uh, development of air pollution um, control in Southeast Asia via the ASEAN um, or organizational, net organizational network. When I say that, it sounds really cheesy, but what it was was that um, the, we have a lot of air pollution called the haze in Southeast Asia, which really affects everybody, um, especially during the haze season. And uh, I was just sort of very intrigued, how do we get here and why is it so bad, even though it's been going on for, I don't know, 40, 50 years already. So that's my specific specialization. So it's awesome. I think it's nice that everybody has their own little uh, uh, pet sort of um, that we've been uh, cultivating uh, through, through our academic career. Um, but sort of one last introduction question then about the humanities, and, and this is for uh, all of us to sort of share our personal opinions. Then. For audience members who are you know, unfamiliar or, or, or not too uh, familiar with what the humanities is, what sort of subjects are considered humanities? Obviously we have history and um, classics represented here, but what other topics could fall under the umbrella of, of the humanities that, that we know of um, in our separate universities as well, maybe? Brian, if you could start off. I can try. Um, so I think, I think to me, the humanities are any subject that really teaches us or, or helps us think about what it means to be human versus subjects that are more, that help us think about the world you know, in general, the world around us. Um, so there's no sort of hard line, I think, as Zina mentioned a bit earlier, you know, between the social sciences, between things like economics, um, anthropology, anthropology um, geography, um, even archaeology, and the more sort of things that we would associate as humanities proper languages, philology, uh, linguistics, um, literature, and then as, as we're talking about um, today, um, history and, and the classics, and you guys can fill in the rest. But I think um, um, one of the sort of cool things, as um, Sophia mentioned just now, um, is that because there's so, it's so diverse and there's so many intersectionalities, I would kind of consider anything that really helps us figure out what it means to be human, whether past, present, or future, um, to be a humanity subject. And that can also include, um, at certain points in our research, um, some of the sort of more quantitative, so to speak, um, bits like um, economics and uh, sociology. Yeah, I think the, the definition of humanities is tricky, and especially, I think, in current research in history, there is a lot of debate over what is humanities and I mean, especially what is history and why we have such like a disciplinary separation between humanities and social sciences and even just natural sciences, because there is a legacy to academic disciplines having these like distinct separations. And I think something that's interesting is that although I am studying a history degree, I'm doing it at the LSE. The LSE is a school of economics and political science and social science. So my degree is rather than being an MA or an MPhil, it's an MSc. So it's a master's of science, despite the fact that I'm doing a history degree, which I think just goes to show that the humanities are and can be very fluid. And there are so many different approaches to studying humanities that can be much more about culture and identity and just like social beings, but also they can be very qualitative and or quantitative and they can be about science and like I'll, I'll read history papers that have math and equations in it and I'm like what is this like this this is not humanities to me but it really is very much in the eye of the beholder I think you know if you say that the traditional humanities are English for you know us in the English speaking world that would just be literature right history religion philosophy foreign languages area studies 
I think that is very limited and the humanities, there's so much room for interdisciplinary research and analysis. And I think a really interesting turn that contemporary humanities are taking is actually stepping outside of the box of humanities and going to show that in trying to understand the world around us, the, the worlds that have been here that are no longer in existence, we kind of need to look beyond just, you know, what we think of as disciplinary studies. Yeah, I mean, I think these are all very interesting and important points. And just to kind of, again, kind of reiterate that it is such a kind of interdisciplinary sort of discipline, the kind of humanities, and that's why they're plural, obviously. Um, I think what Brian was saying as well about kind of humanity sort of telling kind of helping us understand what it means to be human sort of that study of kind of human culture human civilization um and so that's why we kind of get such kind of such a range from kind of languages to kind of religion um and even kind of economics does creep in there as well um as you were saying and, and science and i think i'm um, just kind of as a sort of anecdote i suppose it was quite interesting for me because one of my modules um brian you probably had to do one for philosophy one for kind of in the first two years um some of them are compulsory and i studied early greek philosophy and i looked at philosophers um like uh, heraclitus um and zeno and i remember coming across in, in kind of several of the papers all these math like you know but what like what you were saying zeno these mathematical equations and it's very scientific looking at kind of ancient cosmology the origins of the universe um and you can kind of see how it all fits together and again it's all kind of building upon this foundation of like yeah what does it mean to be human kind of what how can we kind of puzzle it out and kind of figure out why we're here how we got here and kind of what, what this all means and so it's very very fascinating and I think to kind of think of it in sort of a very kind of narrow sort of kind of almost like a box like sort of way is is actually not the necessary the right way to go about it um, and it's important to be very open-minded I think when thinking about the humanities and the kind of potential for kind of further research and everything like that. Yeah, 100 well, percent. Thank you so much, Sophia, for that sort of summary. And I think I'll, I'll jump in and talk on a more sort of a technical point. Um, I think we sort of touched upon this, but uh, it all also kind of depends on your university as well, what they what they call the humanities and, and what it's not. So, for example, I, I knew that I was sort of choosing between a history degree or international relations degree and looking at degrees in the Netherlands, for example, in some places, international relations was a Bachelor of Arts. Some places it was a Bachelor of Science. Um, I managed to find a degree that combined both history and international relations as the history of international relations. So technically it was a Bachelor of Arts, but this is my sort of personal anecdote to tell any student watching here that you shouldn't be caught up in, in what the humanities means in general. I mean, it's very subjective as everybody has said here, and it's also very determined upon the university as well. So um, just keep that in mind when, when you're thinking about what you want to study at uni. And um, talking about choosing what to study at university, um, I assume that if you're watching this panel, you have an interest in the humanities. So uh, it would be nice to sort of go around the room and if everybody could sort of share what motivated them in particular to study humanities at university. And if I could add a little bit of a second question there, did anybody sort of doubt you maybe about choosing to study humanities or, or did you have, um, yeah, yeah, did, did anybody question why you were going to do that? Brian, if you could start us off, please. Yes. Um, I think, well, I was pretty good at history um, at school. So I was always tending towards that kind of um, subject for university. I did the International Baccalaureate Diploma. So, but I did history alongside physics and math. So I was trying to keep my options open because I'm having by nature a bit of a, an explorer in, in terms of the subjects that I, that I want to dip my toes into. Um, but when it came to actually applying for it, I found out about classics by chance, really. Um, I think it's to Sophia's point about being just open-minded about what about the possibilities. Um, what I did was I went to the um, Oxford website and went through the A to Z list of um, subjects and just kind of like cancelled out the things that I was sure I didn't want to do. Um, um, weirdly, I cancelled out archaeology, I cancelled out mathematics, but you know, as things happened, um, classics does have a bit of logic, it does have a bit of, it has a lot of archaeology in it. Um, but um, in that sort of cancelling exercise, I didn't cancel out um, classics because it sounded pretty interesting. Um, knowing that I kind of wanted to do a humanities um, subject um, without sort of boxing myself in. And so I think that began um, 
that whole sort of adventure into finding out what was classics about, what can I study, what kinds of video games can I play, what sorts of TV shows can I play to just um, um, learn a bit more about what I was what I was uh, going to get into, and it um, it turned out to be quite a um, wonderful um, adventure. Um, did anyone doubt? Um, me doing a humanities subject, not really, mostly because people in Singapore don't know much about classics. So um, most of the questions were, what, um, what, what is that? And um, again, you know, part of the ex that, that, that process of exploring um, and learning about um, the humanities was the chance to talk to people about it and try to explain it in my own way, uh, in my sort of family's own way. Um, um, and then from there, really get even more excited about it. So, um, long winded way of saying, I really just found out about it by um, chance. Oof, my, I have a very, I think like if I hadn't gone into the humanities, uh, that would have been more of a surprise. So, I, my background, both of my parents who I live with in London are academics in the discipline of drama and performance studies. So <laughs> it, it was like, for me, the humanities, I've always seen it as, and, and the arts as a whole, I've always seen it as something that is a good career move because it's the only careers I've really seen growing up as those of my parents. And, you know, seeing the lives that they led, getting to go to conferences all around the world, us going to theater every week, um, just so many books everywhere in our house. I, it was quite natural, I think, that I picked up humanities. But for me, what really spurred my interest in history was actually moving from New York to England when I was nine. I was so fascinated by, of course, the Tudors and Henry VIII and his six wives, like, you know, the classics. And when we moved to London when I was 10, just like seeing all the history around me, seeing the Tower of London, and like, I was obsessed with like, the executions and the guillotines. And like, I found it so interesting because in the States, you know, we have this colonial history. And of course you have like the indigenous histories, but you don't learn so much about it other than founding fathers onward. And it's so limited. And I came to England and was like, wow, this is, there's so much like, just everywhere you go, there's a wealth of history and lives that have been lived and worlds that have been built and then fallen. So I've always been interested in history. However, you know, growing up as like a, a, a top nerd, I also loved physics. I loved graphic design. I would, my two choices for going to uni were either humanities, history, or graphic design. And I did the IB as well because I just couldn't pick four A levels. I needed, I of course needed to six subjects and lose all of the sleep um, so I, I did my higher levels were in history and then um, the higher level of English literature and then design and technology and ultimately what drew me towards history and international relations was that I became very politically involved with amnesty international groups and thinking about human rights and also thinking about the legacies of American imperialism and colonialism as a international American and say, seeing these like different perspectives of the country that I grew up, grew up in. So I really wanted to look at history so that I could better understand, you know, the place I came from and also the international connections of this world around me that I have to engage with just on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm in London and I go, to a coffee shop, you know, <laughs> the first question I get asked, oh, where are you from? So like thinking about like, okay, why, how do these like, what do nationalities mean? What do accents mean? What, what am I as an international person representing? And what is, you know, the things that people associate with me? So I was very drawn to both. And ultimately I think I chose to go the humanities route with added in social science, political science, because I just really wanted to keep learning about everything. And ultimately it was kind of an attempt to better understand myself as well. And to, I don't know, better understand just, yeah, how I as a like little American girl came to England and how did this world that allowed for this kind of travel and immigration and globalization and also extreme inequalities and, you know, identity politics, like how did this all come to be? And therefore 
what really drew me to the political side was I'm like, okay, how could I use history to help address contemporary issues? But yeah, humanities for me has always just been like the thing to do. I think if I hadn't done it, my parents may have just gone me. I've gone into graphic design, which I still do graphic design on the side. Like that's not to say that going into humanities, you can't pursue other things as well, but I don't know. It's, it's such a great field for people who want to learn and keep learning and just have interesting conversations about the world, which as an international person, I think you just do on the regular. Yeah. So um, for me, um, I guess Latin in particular, was sort of a part of my life from very, very early on. I was very lucky at primary school. So I actually went to a state school, but um, we had this, there was a lovely old man who um, volunteered to teach us Latin every lunch, uh, no, not every lunchtime, but once a week um, as part of this thing called the Minimus Primary Latin Project, which is kind of Latin for children um, at a very, very kind of elementary level. Um, and I just did this Latin lunch club once a week and I loved it. Um, for me, it was very fascinating because so Latin has a very kind of, to, to kind of someone unfamiliar with it, a very strange sort of word order, everything is a bit um, all over the place. Um, and that really intrigued me. And I found it like a bit like kind of code breaking. I, I was always very interested in that, um, kind of more from the analytical point of view. And so for me, um, I guess it was more about the language to begin with. Um, and so I actually got to kind of study Latin from kind of year three to year six at primary school. Um, and then at secondary school as well, um, I was lucky enough to be able to study Latin as part of the curriculum there um, at my school. Um, and then a kind of few years later, so in kind of year nine, I was I was in the kind of top set for Latin. And so I was chosen to be part of the ancient Greek um, we were called kind of Gratin. Um, so I studied ancient Greek. So I actually did Latin and Greek at GCSE and then at A level as well. Um, and my other A levels were kind of chemistry because, yeah, that's just random because I enjoyed it. And um, French because, again, languages. And I think, you know, kind of what Brian was saying is I was very interested in the ancient world and in the languages, but I was also very good at the language. And I think that is something important to consider as well. I mean, it's very, you know, it is challenging as well to kind of study, you know, ancient languages in particular, I think, but it is, if, if it's something that comes quite naturally to you, then, you know, I, this is harder if you haven't kind of necessarily been exposed to it, but I was lucky enough to have been exposed to it. And so I think for me, it was sort of one of those things that I couldn't let go, which sounds really strange. It was sort of part of my life from quite an early stage. And I guess when there were opportunities to say drop the subject or kind of carry on with something else, I just kind of couldn't. I was just so I just I loved it so much. And I think the more I learned about it and um, as I kind of realized that it wasn't just about these languages, it wasn't just about looking at Latin and Greek and as, as languages, it was about this whole world. Um, all the, the, these cultures from so many kind of different time periods and um I just it, it kind of just just sort of stayed I don't know very close to my heart I guess um and actually for quite a while before kind of thinking about careers I actually I, I still wanted to study the kind of Greco-Roman world but I also wanted to be a vet which sounds a bit strange but that was I wanted to be a vet because I love animals as well so I chose quite science options and actually um like in addition to that and so I think that's why I sort of ended up with chemistry as well on the side um but the balance might have been a bit different I might have ended up studying kind of sciences and then just sort of classics for fun but then I sort of realized why should I just study it kind of for fun like I can take this why can't I just take this as far as I want to? Um, and I think the brilliant thing about classics, I mean, I think the same goes for history as well, is that it really does offer you the opportunity to exercise like a wide range of skills as well. So you can kind of, you've got that kind of more creative um, kind of side of, 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 of thinking, but then you've also got the kind of analytics, analytical skills you, you get as well from like looking at different kind of sources and different kind of forms, um, um, as well as the kind of more linguistic skills that you pick up. So I think in terms of, um, people kind of doubting me I think I, I my parents were very supportive and I think once they my my father in particular once he realized kind of what classics was because I think a lot of people don't really know he thought actually that's a pretty impressive kind of degree to pursue because um you know you learn so many different skills um and so I think yeah one, once people realize what classics is they are a lot more kind of open-minded about it and can kind of see why you might choose it because it sets you up very nicely for all sorts of kind of whether you want to kind of go into academia later or kind of all sorts of kind of industries as well which value those skills so it's not just about the kind of study in itself it's about what it 
the kind of foundation it, it kind of provides for kind of future kind of career as well, which I think we'll get onto a bit later as well. So, yeah. Yes. Th thank you so much, Sophia. That, that was a wonderful segue into what we're going to be talking about next. But before we go on, I just wanted to share my own experiences as well. Um, um, my my uh, father is a he's an ambassador, and uh, I kind of grew up as a as a diplomat kid. So I'm, I moved all around the world, and um, as as you know, we're saying as an international. Uh, kid essentially you're, you're exposed to so many different sort of cultures and and, and, and histories and way of thinking that um I like I I think a lot of people would be surprised if I also didn't uh, end up in the humanities as well but also what Brian was saying I very I was I was very very strong in in, in history and, and English in high school as well I very very good at writing I think that was one of my my biggest skills and it just seemed like a natural progression to be like oh I'm very good at writing so let me try English I can't write creative um, writing for life of me so I was like all right I'll stick to academic writing and then that's just sort of how I got 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 into history and I feel like um yeah it, it is a sort of passion that was cultivated at a very young age and it's something that I think is, is shared by a lot of people in the humanities as well but uh the beautiful thing is that I feel like a lot of us are very dis interdisciplinary as well I mean potential vet potential graphic designer here as well so uh that's great and um so we've talked a lot about what the humanities means and, and what it actually is and stuff like that but maybe we can sort of shift the focus a bit more about the actual study of of, of, of humanities and then we can move on to a little bit on on career as well um so one thing that I uh, would have really benefited from knowing before I started my sort of history degree that I wish I had asked somebody beforehand is what can you actually expect from a humanities course? As in like, what does your study year look like? What is the breakdown of it? Are you in lectures? Are you in, uh, what, what does it actually look like? So if we could just maybe give some top tips to students on what to expect in your first year onwards in uni uh, in terms of your classes and what to expect expect from university that that would be great Ryan if you could start us off please thank you uh yes well actually I was going to build off something that Sophia said um, um about dealing with the ancient languages because um, it is quite a steep learning curve especially for people who've not had um exposure to them um before university um thankfully um not just Oxford and Cambridge but more and more universities these are accept, accepting students um, without prior experience in uh, Latin and Greek, um, but to do the classics. So um, for someone like me, um, without any knowledge of Latin and Greek before university, um, um, we did quite an intensive couple of, well, intensive four years worth of our language training alongside um, all the different classical fields. So I think if you're starting out with the classics, with the languages, it more or less meant five, uh, 9 a.m. classes five days a week uh, on Latin. Um, in the Oxbridge system, it's the tutorial or supervision system. So it's very sort of one to one tutor to one student, two students, three students, but really no more than um, four. Um, the tutorial system is typically weekly per subject so it's just about one hour maybe tops 90 minutes um, um, per week with your tutor having done about a two and a half thousand word essay beforehand so um, add on to that about three to five well usually five um, hours of language classes um, if you're starting out um, from scratch and then you've got a smattering of um, lectures to that you can consider taking. So I think maybe in my first year, let's roughly say maybe four hours of lectures per week. Um, and it varies um, 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 over the course of the degree. The degree, I would say majority of the time is really trying to understand the subject um, by oneself um, in the library, um, reading up things, um, asking colleagues and asking fellow students for help. Um, whether it's lectures, whether it's the tutorial, um, especially in the Oxbridge system, whether it's classes, um, it's really uh, an opportunity for lots of in-depth um, exploration um, with what, nine, 10 hours of contact um, each week. And then for me, it went down a little bit as, as, as I advanced in my degree. So probably by the end, I was really just focusing on uh, tutorials, um, which brought it down to about maybe three, two hours a week.
So I, I'll draw from my undergraduate experience because I, I think that's more the target audience here. Um, you see this change with your master's and also I think with COVID, it's gonna be looking very different anyways at a lot of universities. But so for me, at most universities in the UK, your first year doesn't count in terms of your final degree. Actually for the LSE, that is not the case. It does count. Um, I did not go there for my undergraduate, so it's fine. Um, uh, at Exeter, I was doing two subjects from two different schools. So history, which is a humanities in the School of Humanities, and then international relations, which is in the School of Social Science. For the history side of things, you would, in your first two years, you would get a mixture of lectures and then to, like tutor seminars. That's the word. Uh, so the lectures would teach would traditionally be you know, presented by someone who's more senior in the discipline, someone who is providing information, and then the seminars would be taught by a PhD student or a master's student. And it would be a forum of a much smaller group of students where you can explore your ideas a bit more thoroughly, engage in debates. And with history, something that was quite valuable was also we'd have a separation between doing like secondary literature analysis and then source analysis, where you would look at primary text, photographs, videos, and you get to do more analysis of these things. So there's like this really nice visual element to history that I loved where you're not just always reading. Like I wrote a paper based on visually <laughs> analyzing statues uh, in the USSR and the meaning of these statues, um, which of course you need to draw on some secondary literature to balance your points of view, but you can take this really interesting visual or even just audio analysis, looking at films, um, I don't know, music, which is great. As the years progressed, uh, we would then kind of combine our lectures with our seminars. So we would be assigned readings or source analysis that we had to do in our own time. And then we would go into seminars, which would be about two hours long, twice a week, with small groups of students with one senior academic where we would then kind of discuss the readings and the sources and go into depth about that and with history i think that was you kind of grow into that so it's not just about gathering information and reading and repeating it's about developing your own critical analysis skills and your ability to construct ideas and have opinions about not just you know the things that happened in the past that you're looking at but also the writing of those things and that for me was the most important part about history that i actually think doing the ib really prepared me for that because international baccalaureate you have a with history there is obviously an emphasis on to get to sixth and seventh you need to focus on historiography which is the history of history which when you get to university that is like the first thing that they say you need to come to terms with what, what this is. And I do think like, yeah, something I also would agree with everyone is that there is, you know, you, there is a lot of writing and a lot of reading. And I think it is very important to, with the humanities to go in knowing that, like you can bring in sources that aren't based on words. You can bring in anything you want, but ultimately, you do have to master academic writing. And I think the way that my university years progressed, you can tell like it was preparing us to get to a point where we can write independently and be more academic and critical with our writing. So just the transition from having lectures and seminars to only seminars, I think was very important because it means that you are expected to take in the information yourself by the end of the degree and be able to write by yourself and have your own ideas and be independent, which most universities in the UK, if English is not your first language, or even if you just struggle with academic writing, they have free writing resources and classes and mentors that can help you perfect that. And something I really valued about Exeter was we had a lot of essays that were practices. So, Although I 
you know, I've always excelled at writing academically. I've always excelled at history. I've always been like the valedictorian of everything I do <laughs> in history because I just love it so much. I like, I breathe it, I live it. I actually almost failed my first essay at Exeter because I just wasn't prepared for the academic writing that they required. But because it was a practice, I then could take that and grow. So yeah, I would say I probably spent a lot of my time reading actually more time reading than writing I would be in the library like every day except for the weekends and the thing is that when you read you learn how to write through reading so yeah I think I probably have like five hours of classes and seven hours a week maybe spend you know four hours a day in the library on average when when it was like exam season or essay season but I don't know it, it all just if you enjoy it, it, it just feels like you're doing something you love. So I actually don't even know how much time I spent doing different things because I just loved every second I spent working. I say that now at the time I probably didn't, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's different. Each stuff is different and international relations is also very different, but that's my history side of things. Yeah. So, um, Kind of obviously Brian and I studied the same course, but it was slightly different because I went in, I was kind of course 1A, which is having background of Latin and ancient Greek. And I think what this meant for me is that it was slightly less structured in the sense that I didn't have language classes every single day. I think I think I maybe had one Latin and one Greek kind of once a week um, of kind of language classes. And this was just for the first two years. Um, and we also had kind of again a couple of reading classes where we would read in the original language um, and so this wouldn't probably be possible um, if you come in without Latin or Greek because I was already from A level kind of fairly comfortable reading them in the original but by no means perfect so um, the aim of the first two years is to kind of develop fluency in kind of reading the ancient languages um, as well as kind of developing like what Zina was saying that kind of appropriate academic style of writing and that is very important and I think really as Zina was saying actually the best way to do that is to read the more you read the more it kind of assimilates into your own mind of kind of the right way to, to kind of go about developing your own sort of style and also your own kind of to really, to really think critically about everything that you're kind of coming into contact with. Um, I would say that the Oxford course um, is quite structured. Um, the first two years there there are kind of a lot of kind of sessions um to kind of of kind of both uh, uh, just as well as kind of reading and and writing kind of essays um every week there are quite a lot of other sessions as well um so kind of with this the kind of tutorial system um and also we had some larger seminars from time to time um kind of focusing on history and archaeology um these were called texts and contexts um and um they were kind of with um a kind of larger group of students and there were also sessions in the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, um, to kind of actually, these are my probably my favourite, to actually go and literally see the kind of sculptures and the, the, all the, the material in like person and vase handling sessions um, for me as well, because I focus more on the art and archaeology towards the end, um, and as well as kind of some coin handling. So there were kind of different opportunities, but I would say that it is really important to realise that when studying the humanities, I think it is really important to be self-disciplined and most self-motivated because most of the time you know most of the time outside of kind of lectures and things is you sitting down in the library or I actually preferred studying in my own room I wasn't a massive fan of studying with other people but um wherever you study it doesn't really matter I'm sitting down with a book and kind of reading writing um and even so for, for me the lectures were optional so it was very strongly encouraged that you attend them because that's you know to, to learn from leading academics directly to, be able to ask them questions you know there is kind of no great opportunity really so I would highly recommend attending them but the attendance was kind of it really varied so I think there were some terms where I had maybe four or five lectures a week other times just one or two you know it really really did vary but in the times that I wasn't attending lectures I was kind of filling that with just further reading um, and trying to gather sort of as much exposure to the kind of subjects that I was studying as possible um, so I think it is quite flexible but as I said I think the Oxford degree is a bit more structured than perhaps some just because there are kind of quite a lot of 
weekly deadlines of things that you have you have to do the reading classes you have to do the language classes to begin with and um you have to kind of just kind of constantly submit essays so you know you can't really get away with sort of just cramming later you know you have to be very organized with your time um in the same way that you would if you studied say a science degree i would say Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, we actually got our first live question from the audience, and this always makes me very happy. So we have a question here, and it is for our classics panelists. It says and asks, does the field of classics only cover Western, uh, Greek, Roman, etc. history slash sources, or can we also be expected to uh, learn a bit more about other regions, such as uh, ancient India, for example? Um, Brian, Sophia, could you guys uh, give an answer, please? I'm happy to give some of the answer and Brian, you can fill in whatever. Um, so, I mean, primarily we are looking at the Greco-Roman world, but that doesn't mean Western. And I think this is a common misconception. I mean, I'm sure Brian can yeah, add, add whatever. But um, we also, so anything that sort of affects the Greco-Roman world is sort of what we study. Um, and that can very much include the East. And it's really, really important actually not to disregard that. So um, one of my modules was um, early Greek hexameter poetry. Um, so that's looking at primarily works like the Iliad and the Odyssey. But a big part of that is actually understanding the sort of, I guess, the sort of dialogue with the East. And in fact, a lot of motifs kind of, th this is a whole can of worms I, I won't go into, but kind of a lot of motifs, things like that, kind of borrowed arguably from the East, um, looking at um, getting to study kind of the Epic of Gilgamesh as well, for example, um, and some kind of a bit more niche kind of Akkadian texts and things like that. Um, for the text and context module that I mentioned earlier, we looked at some Persian sources as well, looking at the kind of um, monuments from Persepolis um, in Iran, um, and also the Bisatun inscription, which is in kind of definitely not Latin and Greek, um, and kind of just generally that, there is so much contact with the East. And I think in one of my um, art and archaeology lectures, I do remember there being even a kind of few bits, you, you mentioned Indian sources. So that's not primarily something which is covered, but there was an example of a kind of Indian sculpture uh, and you could kind of see the sort of parallels. Um, and I think it's very, very important, as I kind of said earlier, to be really open-minded and to kind of, to kind of, to kind of look at the ancient world as, as a sort of, this kind of bigger picture. And I think that's something that's becoming increasingly important in the field of classics. Um, perhaps there was in the past more of a focus on the West um, and the kind of Western canon um, of kind of literature and art archaeology. But increasingly, classics is really, really broadening and it is very, very valuable to actually to be able to understand this the kind of Western point of view, to also be able to look at the East and, and see where they kind of how they intersect. Um, and this is some, one of the things that I was actually most um, interested about um, and passionate about as well. So, yeah, great question. Thanks, Sophia. I don't really have much to add. I think, yeah, I think it's worth remembering that the classical world was a porous one. And um, there were a lot of interactions at all sorts of levels, whether it's trade, whether it's cultural, um, through family and marriage, um, all the sorts of inter uh, intersections and inter interactions between peoples of different cultures. So um, I remember attending a lecture by um, my tutor um, at the Queen's College um, at Oxford, who was speaking about the Mahabharata, uh, an Indian epic, and how um, how one of the lead um, female characters in the Mahabharata had really similar sort of characteristics to Helen and the Homeric um, and ancient and, and, and early Greek um, epic um, poetry. And it was, you know, to someone fairly new to the subject, slightly sort of, in a good way, disconcerting how many parallels there were um, between texts of what we would usually think of as very different, and they are very different um, cultures and, and histories. Um, I think as you, obviously, as you start off, you have to tick off all the big boxes Take off your Homer, take off your Virgil, um, take off your Aristotle and your Plato. But as you progress on, there are more and more opportunities to explore um, other parts of the ancient world, whether it's the ancient Mesopotamians, whether it's the ancient Egyptians, um, even the ancient Italians. You know, they didn't sort of automatically or early on speak Latin. Um, they also had their own um, local languages, um, and so it, it's really a um, rich sort of. Um, world of, of, of 
multiple multiple um, cultures and multiple multiple interactions um, between cultures um, so whether it's you know, north northern britain or the red sea um, and the connection to the indian subcontinent um, whether it's through um, mesopotamia or even like the north of, of germany where the sort of uh, Roman Empire's northern uh, frontiers, but um, there's a lot more than just the uh, so Greek and Latin that, that, that we're most familiar with. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. I hope to answer your question um, to our lovely uh, question giver. So time has flown by so fast. We, we only have a few minutes left until the end of the hour. And um, I kind of want to wrap up two questions into one then that I think I really want to make sure that we sort of um, get, get to pass it on to our audience. So the, the first question then is, um, you know, I feel like humanities get a, gets a really bad rep in terms of job opportunities and and, and how you know uh, you're going to build a career out of it. I personally feel it's a huge misconception. I'm sure everybody here will agree as well. So I think we sort of share the podium to kind of uh, defend our uh, study. But also, can I tag on a, a small little question then? Is if you could give a little bit of advice to uh, your high school self, if you could go back in time, in terms of you know studying humanities and preparing for the future, what advice would you give yourself? I know it's a loaded question and we don't have that much time, but um, if it's anything that humanities students is good at, it's uh, saying a lot of things in a short amount of time and hopefully uh, one of those uh, <laughs> 20 things that we said will stick. So uh, Brian, if you could kick us off, please. Uh, yes. All right, so I'm working at a nonprofit at the moment um, in Singapore. And we deal a lot with complex problems that can't be solved by any one stakeholder um, in society. So um, complex problems um, related you know, humanitarian problems, um, elder care, um, vulnerable segments of the population, um, and all that sort of thing. Um, I think what the humanities gives us for careers, a um, couple of bits, really strong sort of analytical and critical skills. So whether it's the logic behind languages, whether it's the analysis behind history and archaeology and philosophy, um, all these skills are really, really relevant to the contemporary world because the world's quite messy. And there's a lot going on and there's a lot of need in a, in a day to day job to work with a lot of people and you know, having deep dived into just trying to understand what it means to be human for three or four years that, that set you up really well to going out into a career and, 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 and working with people for better, for, for a better society. Um, so that's one around skills. The second one around skills is that a lot of the ways we think about the past, especially about history, are actually, and this is to as Leah's um, earlier thing, um, actually quite helpful for thinking about the future. So um, you know, a lot of my work at the moment is trying to differentiate between the signals and the noise of the trends that we're seeing today and how our future society is going to look like. And that sort of process of making sense of patterns, finding the patterns, and, and just seeing how significant or important they are, that's a really classic history question. Like, you know, what was the significance? What was the importance of so-and-so patterns leading up to a certain event or a certain um, historical circumstance? So that's the second on the skills. And I think finally, it's that whole interdisciplinary idea that we've been talking about this evening. Um, the humanities really make us think in systems. And uh, again, in, in my field of work, systems thinking, system design, system, systems practice are all really important ways that um, different industries, whether you're finance, whether you're consulting, um, whether you're government, um, whether um, you're, you're in the nonprofit sector, we all really need to start thinking a lot more in terms of systems um, so that you know, the work with, that we do can really make a positive difference, a positive impact um, in society. So um, yeah, those um, three points too around the really valuable skills and then how it really helps us think, think holistically in our systems. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that we're hearing from you, Brian, because you're like currently in an actual working setting. So I think it's when you're talking to humanities students who are still studying, it's very easy to kind of for us to be a bit lost in our heads of thinking about our subjects. So it doesn't always sound like, you know, we're going to be transferable into real world work like 
I could go on for hours about like, you know, the, the importance of like decolonial hybridity in the study of history. And you'd be like, but wait, how, how does that help apply you to go study like, or go work in a nonprofit? But the thing is, once you get out of your degree, once you get out of that mindset, humanities degrees, they have equipped you with so many skills. So and just going to university in general and making the most out of your time through doing extracurriculars or like I used to edit and write for a student newspaper. It, when I came out with my degree, I just kind of had a wealth of opportunity that I didn't really expect, but I should have known would be there. So I personally went, I would say a more like, I don't know, stereotypical humanities where I went and taught English for a bit. Then I went and worked at a political nonprofit and I, I co-managed it in New York City. But I have friends who've gone in to work for translation companies, to work for banks, to work as accountants, as, to go for further studies into law. I have a friend who works for the government. All of us came from having the same degree, basically, uh, either in history or history and international relations. And they've all gone in to do so many different things. And I think it is because you are gifted with this ability, or rather not even gifted, you build this ability to be open to learning and listening to many different things and figuring out the best solution and coming to hearing so many, like if you're in a meeting and you hear like five different ideas, that humanities degree will have given you the ability to hear the best part of each idea and churn out something that is like going to combine everything into a solution that works for everyone. It gives you the opportunity to be analytical, to read data, not just literature, but like numbers and tables and use that data to then, I don't know, address a problem or I don't know, for me, like control website traffic for the nonprofit I used to work for. So there is just, I don't know, there's humanity degrees are excellent because they kind of give you this intellectual freedom to explore subjects that you really love. And they really help you come into your own as a individual, as a researcher, but they also employ you with the skills that can go into essentially any field of work, I would say, except for maybe, I don't know, medicine. Like, although I do know people who have studied history and then transferred and become doctors through doing further education because that history degree gave them like a thoughtful critical analysis that actually is really useful <laughs> when you're a doctor and you're dealing with people from many different cultures with different backgrounds and you know nothing is truly objective like even when you go to get a diagnosis at a hospital the reason you're being diagnosed with something is based off of people who have decided to research a certain area because of cultural and political influences. There's a reason why, you know, like sickle cell anemia is not as heavily studied as breast cancer because it doesn't affect, like in the UK anyways, the majority white population, whereas breast cancer affects everybody regardless. So humanity, yeah, they give you that sensitivity that analysis, that critical thinking, and also just a really good, I don't know, way, like, way to be thoughtful and caring in whatever you do. And I just think it's such a transferable degree. And it's also fun. If you like what you're doing, you will find a way to make any career you want. But part of going to university is giving yourself the space to figure that out. And yeah, I think it's just, I don't know why everyone says we don't get jobs. We get jobs. We are employed. Thanks, Zina. And so, Sophia, I just want to jump in and say you you do have um if you, if you guys don't mind staying a little bit over time, we are uh, we are uh, available to stay a few minutes. So, Sophia, please say your piece. I I'm not going to cut you off from from time limit. So go, go ahead and 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 share it if you really like to. Thank you. Just to like finish off, I mean, I think it's undeniable that like not just classics, but the humanities in general, they do provide you with transferable skills, as we've been saying, and you know. I, I really do think that having the opportunity to develop not only kind of analytical skills um, and kind of the more sort of, yeah, kind of like logical structured way of thinking, um, but also kind of creative skills, kind of that power of independent thought. Um, Zina, you were talking about intellectual freedom. I think these are all 
extremely valuable um, skills to kind of build upon and develop. And they're so important in, in the kind of wider world. And I think what Brian was saying about that kind of thinking in systems and being able to identify patterns, that's something that I think both history and classics provide you with. Um, and when we look at the problems of today, um, we need to be able to have that kind of more holistic bird's eye view. And I think the humanities are very interesting because they not only enable you to do that, to kind of look, to kind of be able to step back and look at the bigger picture, break it down, kind of identify the problems and then try and work out kind of some potential solutions, but also that ability to think at a very kind of small, you know, minute level, kind of if, if you're thinking about say Latin or Greek, you're looking at little tiny word endings and how one one like group of words might affect the meaning and completely change it. And I think having the opportunity to develop both of those kinds of skills, that kind of very small way of thinking, and then kind of being able to have a look at the bigger picture, I think these are things that employers really greatly value. And kind of added to that as well, um, I would say that the humanities, perhaps more than a science uh, or kind of, um, I guess, kind of non-humanities degree, um, develops really, really very much your communication skills. And I think that's something that is often overlooked, but having spent, so I've, I've taken a gap year this year, I've done kind of volunteering at social enterprise, um, among other things. And I'm now, I've now got a place on a kind of quite a competitive um, and incredible a startup graduate program called Jumpstart, um, which I would highly recommend everyone kind of look into. Um, it's amazing. And I'm about to, in September, start a role as a marketing and operations um, associate um, at a kind of revolutionary sort of sustainable um, eco kind of laundry company, laundry care company um, in, in kind of very much the business world. Um, and I think it's to be able to kind of bring those, those sort of communication skills, that power to kind of think a bit outside the box in a kind of more entrepreneurial way, it's very much possible to get that from a humanities degree. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm basically going into the startup world um, and I, I don't think I could have had a better foundation than studying, studying humanities. Um, and so I would really, really highly recommend. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful, Sophia. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to jump in because we have the time to sort of put my two cents into it. I think it's it's a very outdated sort of thinking saying that, oh, a, a degree is only useful if you get a job immediately related to what that degree is in. You know, especially nowadays, my younger sister is going to start uh, the IB going in. And I've told her that the sort of jobs that you're going to be looking at when you graduate probably don't even exist right now, um, let alone when you graduate from your university degree. So I think when you go into humanities, what it does is that it provides you with all these soft skills that have been cultivated within these four years. And it really makes you, as Sophia was saying, eloquent, communicative, you know, and, and thoughtful and just a bit more, um, I don't know, worldly perhaps, or maybe that's just me uh, um, building up my own ego. But what, what I will say is that I, I feel like we're with the humanities degrees, you know, you, you can learn hard skills, you know, you can learn how to code, you, you can learn how to, you can do courses and all these type of things, but uh, it's, it's something different to to learn how to be an effective communicator. I mean, um, I, I will, not only in speaking, but also in, in writing as well. And you'll, you'll be surprised, I think, as humanity students, we forget how um, bad some writing can be. <laughs> uh, and it is a very, very useful skill, and it is a very valuable skill for employers as well. Um, uh, so I'm starting, I started my PhD this uh, January after doing a bit of a gap year as well, um, Sophia, and this opportunity came, it, it, it just dropped in from LinkedIn. So if there's one uh, comment or, or takeaway for all of our audience now or in the future watching, please update your LinkedIn account and, and you know, network from there, because you do have the skills and, and you do have the opportunities uh, if you just put yourself out there a little bit. But I also wanted to say a bit about Sophia's startup um, experience. I mean, obviously I'm working with Millie and Millie itself is a startup. Uh, I'm the content editor here. It doesn't have anything to do with history really, but what it does have to do is uh, communicating to the correct audience, communicating in, in the right sort of tone and, and language, but also just communicating within a team as well. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, Brian sort of mentioned at the beginning of the um, panel that humanities is about studying what it means to be human and to be a good human. I think it's to understand how you work, but also how you work with the people around you as well. So uh, I hope I haven't, I, I hope I didn't ramble that much. It's a bit awkward for me to say my own piece as a moderator, but I really want to thank to you, thank everybody here, Brian, Zina, Sophia, for taking time out of your weekend to, to join us and to all of our audience watching live or watching later. Thank you again for 
taking one, out of, one hour of your time to uh, reflect a bit upon what the humanities is, what it means to be studying it, and also career opportunities in the future. Um, if you want to get in contact with, with us or any of the panelists, you know, you can uh, shoot us a DM and our, on our Instagram uh, at Millie underscore group. We'll be happy to put you in uh, connection with anybody here. Um, other than that, thank you again to everybody and hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Bye.